Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in this world. Welcome to this review on a recent interview given by Greg Stafford. Some of you might know he was once a Jehovah's Witness in the Watchtower, and now I believe he's an independent uh, person doing his own thing, ministry, but I think uh, still affiliated with many of the teachings of the Watchtower, including the one that I'll review today. He did a interview with our friend over at Faithful Theology, and um, it had to do with the so-called pre-existence issue. So most Christians, uh, whether they're Trinitarians or non-Trinitarians or so-called Unitarians, uh, believe that the Son of God, known to us as Jesus of Nazareth, the historical Jesus, had a pre-existence. In other words, as the Watchtower says, uh, he had a pre-human existence. And uh, Greg Stafford still holds to that belief, but he talked about a spirit son Christology. And uh, those are his words, spirit son. So I'll play a couple of clips from this discussion, this interview he gave over the weekend over at Faithful Theology channel, and you'll find the link in the description. It was a good interview because uh, Faithful had very good questions, I thought, although it needed many follow-ups to the questions just to clear up. But I think uh, Greg is a good speaker. He's a good presenter. He's very clear, and he's uh, well self-educated. He's a self-educated man, mainly with his theology and knowledge of the Bible. And um, Greg did a good job explaining how he understands um, the person we know as Jesus of Nazareth. So I'll play a few clips here, and then I'll give you some of my comments, my review. And uh, I tried to have these clips as um, full as possible. In other words, not to cut too much out of it due to the time restraints that I have today. And I don't want to play the whole, you know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but I believe I did capture most of what Greg said. And I hope uh, he doesn't think I'm, you know, doing a Fox News or CNN hitch up here and just, uh, cutting and splicing things he did not say. So this is these are clips that are mainly just, if you notice one cut here or there is mainly due to uh, uh, what we call the silence or something that needed just to follow up quickly. So here's the uh, first clip where Greg explains this, uh, what he calls spirit son, Jesus, who preexisted. I understand Jesus as a pre-existent spirit son of God, as one of the sons of God, in fact, the son of God, but certainly one of the sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6, Deuteronomy 32 in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Job, and in Proverbs 30, in verses 4 and 5, texts that refer to ascending and descending, referring explicitly to God and his name, and in the Hebrew, the name of his son. Now, in the Greek, it says name of his sons. Either way, this idea of sonship, which I believe Jesus builds upon in his response to the Jews in John 10, is something very clearly taught in the Bible. When we see angels, for example, these sons of God in the Old Testament, taking on human form. So that's not what I believe the Bible teaches about Jesus. When angels took human form in the Old Testament, we're not told exactly you know, how they do that or the mechanics that are involved in the metaphysical to physical transfer, but they do it. It's explicit that they appear as humans, they eat, and then they can dematerialize or however you want to describe it, but they're not born as a human being, right? In the New Testament, I believe it teaches that Jesus actually existed as a spirit son of God, as in the form of a God or God, Philippians 2. We can talk about more in a minute. But just to define the view so it's clear what I'm saying is possible, right? You want to know, how is this possible? Well, first, let me explain what I believe is possible. 
or happen. So you had a spirit son of God like the angels. They can take human form. But in this case, one of those sons of God, the son of God, completely destroys himself. That's what the verb kanao means in Philippians 2. Existing in the form of a God or God and destroyed himself and took on the form of a man. When he was born through Mary, I believe he literally was created as a human being. So, for example, he didn't know who he was when he was an infant. He didn't know who he was until he got a little older. That's why Philippians 2 says, 2, 7, and 8, when he realized he was in the form of a man, he became obedient as far as that. It, it uses a verb, irisco, that means find out. Very anti-Trinitarian because they believe he was always God, never stopped being God. But if you have to find out, if you have to realize you're a man, then at some point you didn't know that. Of course, they had the whole dual nature thing, but either way. So I believe he completely died, not died, right? So he didn't die in the sense that he was killed as a spirit. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself, pal too. It, the reflexive personal pronoun that means that's the object of the empty, himself. So he destroyed himself and was born as a man and lived as a man and as a man, the body that God prepared and that he helped prepare to prepare him for this to be the last Adam sacrifice in our view. So when he was destroyed and became born as a man, he didn't realize who he was until later. Exactly when that was is debatable. But Philippians 2 says when he found out, when he realized he was in the appearance of a man, he decided to be obedient. He didn't rebel, he didn't take advantage of it. Now, Socinians want to say, well, that's, that's what that means. But that's after he emptied himself of being in the form of a God which they take as like this functional divine royalty as a man. But if that's the case, then why would he have to take the form of a man or become a man? They focus on slave there, but it says a man also. But if he was already a man and just functionally God, why would it then have to say he's, he becomes a man, just say he becomes a slave? So it's very important that Socinians and others understand that the Bible teaches Jesus was destroyed as a spirit. He did it to himself and then born as a man. Same person. And again, how that actually works, right? So there's not like two persons like Trinitarians think. Some Socinians seem to think there's like not enough room in a human to have this pre-existent person. Well, he didn't even realize who he was until later. He's literally a man, perfect, sinless because of God and the line he prepared through to Mary. So this whole purpose was spoken about in Eden in response to Satan. So seems like to say, well, that's, yeah, right. It's all for, for ordaining stuff. But the same Socinians will admit there's a difference, a huge difference between foreordaining and pre-existing. So yes, when it's talking about things that will happen in the future, that's foreordination. But when it's talking about existing in a certain state and then taking on another state, there's no foreordination there. There's just existential ideas being expressed. That's how I believe it was possible. He literally destroyed himself in the spirit and was born through Mary because of God as man. Then when he died as a man, he was completely dead in the spirit and in the flesh. That's why Galatians 1, 1 says the father raised him up from the dead. But he says in John 2, 19 through 21, break down this temple and in three days, I will raise it up, referring to his body. So he died and trusted his spirit to the father and the father resurrected him and gave him a new body in which state first Peter three says he went and preached to other spirits. I don't see a problem. I just see these different existences that the firstborn son of God uniquely takes and or is given in the case of, of the resurrection. It's not a question of being possible or impossible. It's what he chose to do. It's what God made happen. And he did it. Okay, so that was uh, Greg's explanation of his spirit son Christology. So just a few things about what he said there, in case you did not quite catch it. Jesus was a pre-existent spirit son of God, or one of the sons of God, he said. And that's, uh, he gave examples in Genesis 6, talks about the sons of God cohabiting or having relations with human women. 
Job chapter 1, where you have the scene of the sons of God in heaven, and among them uh, shows up uh, Satan, the devil, and as the son of God. So he's one of the sons of God, and he's also the son of God, the unique son of God. And then Greg gave there a proof text to that, uh, Proverbs 30, verse 4 and 5. So before we continue here with this review, just to rebut the uh, Proverbs 30 and show you something interesting about that, if you go to one of our websites, thehumanjesus.org, there's a list we created called the Traditional Trinitarian Texts. I put in the link. And we give a, our explanations, our view, or alternative readings from a from a, a Trinitarian perspective, or I should say, apart from a Trinitarian perspective. And if you look down here, just scroll down. So this is about Proverbs 30. So what is the name of his son? So the verse reads this way, using the NASB. NASB who has ascended into heaven and descended. So that's true. So Greg uh, mentioned that. Uh, it's about the ascending, descending. So someone's going up, someone's coming down. Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? So the subject there of the going up and down seems to be God. <clears throat> and then it says, what is his name? Surely you know. So one of the things we observe here is that the even Trinitarian publications like the ESV Study Bible do not identify the son there as Jesus. Uh, we have a quote there, the Christian reader naturally thinks of the Son of God, but the purpose of the words here is simply to say that no mere human being, whether father or son, has done these things, and that God is the Holy One, as it says in the previous verse 3, whose ways are high and exalted, infinitely greater than the understanding of men. So the verse is simply a contrast with God Almighty, the Holy One, with humans. And, and it has nothing to do with a pre-existent son, as Greg is alleging here. But let's go on to what else he said. Now, this is the most interesting thing, uh, or to many of us, sort of very aberrant thing Greg uh, said in this whole interview. He believes Jesus completely destroyed himself. So that's the way Greg is translating that, that Greek word, kenoo, using the modern Greek pronunciation in Philippians 2.7. And he realized or found out, says Greg, that he was in the form of a man, translating another Greek word there, edisko, evrisko, I should say. So, Greg uh, is really going out on a limb here because I have never come upon this type of interpretation for these, uh, these words in these passages. So, if you look at, again, any standard modern translation, who do have a Trinitarian bias towards this passage, for example, the NIV, has in verse 6, uh, Jesus was in very nature God. That's not what the Greek te text sex says. The Greek simply says he was in the form of God. And the subject in this passage is, is the, the human Jesus, as verse 5 says. But Greg is translating the Greek word there, usually translated emptied in verse 7, as you can see there. He emptied, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant, made in the likeness of men. So Greg is translating that Greek word as destroyed. And he points to one of the definitions of the Greek word kenoo, 
uh, which can be used uh, to mean destroyed, but obviously the context will tell you what the meaning of a word means. I mean, invariably words have different meanings. Most words have different meanings. Uh, here's a good example. In English, if I were to say, I'm shot, S-H-O-T, shot, you might think, oh, no, you, someone shot you with a gun. Or you could mean, as a euphemism or a English idiom, I'm shot, as in I'm done, I'm, I'm tired, you know. <laughs> so the word shot can have different meanings or even different definitions if you look it up. So Greg is uh, quite a, I mean, I was amazed when I heard him uh, say this, and he said it a few times. Uh, Jesus completely died, yet not died in the sense of killed in the spirit. He emptied himself. So there he's actually translating the that Greek word uh, properly. And then he says, but that means he destroyed himself and was born as a man. I'll come back to that as a man that is used a lot by people who believe Jesus had a literal pre-existence as a man and lived as a man in the body God prepared for him. It's very important for Socinians, uh, he means people like me, I guess, although I don't share everything Socinians believed. And by Socinians, Greg Stafford is uh, pointing to the the movement that began in the 16th, 17th century Europe, uh, started by the Sassini uh, uncle and nephew couple from Italy and the so-called Polish brethren. But we do not, uh, at, uh, at least Restoration Fellowship, the ministry I work for, we do not uh, hold to everything Socinian. For example, we differ on the virgin birth I, I believe many Socinians did deny the virgin birth. And also on the topic to do with the atonement, they have different understandings of that. So we're not uh, Socinians in that classic way, if you want to call it. So it's very important, nonetheless, that they understand the Bible teaches Jesus was destroyed as a spirit. He did it to himself, then born as a man, same person. And again, he said this maybe four or five times. Jesus literally destroyed himself in the spirit and was born through Mary because of God as a man. Then when he died as a man, uh, sorry, there might be a typo there, because of God as a man. Okay, sorry. And, and was born through Mary because of God. So somehow... Uh, because of God, I, I guess he means the Father, uh, this pre-existent spirit son is born through Mary as a man. There's that as a man. Then when he died as a man, he was completely dead in the spirit and in the flesh. When he was born through Mary, he was literally created as a man. I don't see a problem. I just see these different existences. Now what's telling here, this, uh, the, the one we know as Jesus, had a previous existence where he basically killed himself. Uh, this is like someone said to me, it sounds like suicide by birth. <laughs> so he, he commits self-destruction, which sounds like suicide. Yet somehow this this what so what was born through Mary? If if there's total destruction of this spirit son individual, why would you say some why would you use the word through in reference to the birth of, of Jesus then? There's nothing to go through, you know what I mean? I mean, I wish I, I could uh, I have asked uh, Greg in the past to to uh, debate me, have a discussion, but uh, he has not uh, even replied. Although he did um, make a video about the uh, wisdom of God issue, but that's another topic uh, that we had. Anyway, 
so yeah that that's very uh amazing <laughs> so yes uh, he kept saying born through mary he's created as a man but there's really no spirit son individual there because he kept saying he kept saying that this jesus killed himself destroyed himself and then he said that these are just different existences that's plural so that's uh, more than one existence now how anyone can have two beginnings two origins uh is beyond me because obviously matthew 1 1 matthew 1 18 uh he describes matthew there the origin genesis of of the son of god your translation might read genealogy or the birth but the greek there is literally genesis which is the beginning the origin by the way by the way anyone watching live uh just type your questions in all caps and i'll try and get to them i'll just give you my perspective as best as i can okay let's go to what another clip here from this discussion where greg talks about the what he called the irrefutable pre-existent texts and they're found in john chapter 8. you know abraham your father when you're talking about he rejoiced when he saw my day and he saw it and he was glad you might say right in john 7 that the jesus says i you know the things i taught are mine i learned from the father Maybe a Sicinian could say, well, yeah, the father told him that's what happened. Father told him about how Abraham rejoiced. Now that you're my manifested revelatory plan, back then, Abraham, the one you're going to go talk about, he rejoiced when he saw you. But, you know, you could argue that way. It's possible in light of John 7. But look at how what they say in response. How did you see Abraham? It doesn't mean the Jews are always right, but follow me here. How did you see Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. Now, at this point, Jesus could say, well, I'm not talking about, you know, me literally seeing him, obviously, right? I'm not 50 yet. Good, good point there. But my father told me, right? I told you guys earlier in John 7, father taught me all these things. So he told me about Abraham. That's not what he did. He used an expression, of course, which is, which is often controversial for Trinitarianism, but which outside of all of that, I believe, no matter how you look at it, I mean, they try to add the predicate, right? Christ, and there's one sense you could do it. me does have that understood predicate. Not always. You have the blind man in John 9. It's just an expression that often has an understood predicate. While it's possible, you definitely have them asking him, how did you see Abraham, right? It's not, how the, where's the Christ foretold before? How did you see Abraham? You're talking about him rejoicing and being glad. What are you talking about? You're acting like you were there. You're not even 50. Well, before Abraham was born, I existed. Or let's follow the Socinian way. Before Abraham was born, I am the Christ, or I existed as the Christ, the plan of the Christ in the mind of God. How does that explain anything? That, that doesn't explain how we saw Abraham rejoice or be glad. And it doesn't tell them the father taught me about those things. So that's how I saw him, okay? You could toy with just how it should be translated. But the idea of existence there, I think, is almost irrefutable. Again, the best attempt is to say, well, the understood predicate's Christ. That means somehow he's the Christ in the mind of God before Abraham. It just leaves unanswered the question. How did you see this? How did you learn this? So I don't think it's a good explanation. It seems to me to be doctrinally driven. Okay, so let's again have a look at some of the things greg said here in this clip the idea of existence in john 8 58 so that's one of his irrefutable so-called pre-existence texts is almost irrefutable yep so then he again talks about the Socinian view again i am not uh i guess a classic Socinian, if you will uh again i do not agree with the way they understood the virgin birth and the atonement. So, but he nonetheless classifies, I guess, every opponent who's non-Trinitarian as a Sinian, does not explain how he saw Abraham rejoice and be glad. Now, it sounds like Greg is saying that Jesus saw Abraham rejoice. 
Um, I'm not sure if that's what he meant. Again, I wish I, he would uh, have a discussion. But uh, if I guess that's what he might mean because he believes that Jesus existed as this spirit son uh, being who destroyed himself, as he said previously. So yes, I guess Jesus saw Abraham rejoice and be glad. Abraham rejoiced when he saw you. So this is the claim from the Pharisees. How did you see Abraham? They asked. It doesn't mean the Jews are always right, but follow me here, says Greg. Now that's interesting. Yes, they're not always right and they're not always wrong. But in this case, I, I think they are wrong, obviously. And then just leaves unanswered the Jewish question and seems to me to be doctrinally driven the way some of our some of us so-called, as he calls us, Socinians, interpret the passage. Now, let me go back to this. Jesus saw Abraham. So let's look at the passage in question, John 8, again, using the NASB. And if you start there in verse 48, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? So his opponents, Jesus' opponents, accuse him of being demonized. And then he says, no, I don't have a demon. I honor my father. I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my, wo my word, he will never see death. The Jews said, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets died. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. So here's the introduction of Abraham. And then again, the prophets died. Whom do you make yourself out to be? So the whole issue here, as it's always the case, has to do with Jesus' identity as the anointed one of Israel. Not some pre-existent spirit son, God the son for Trinitarians. No, it has to do with whether this man from Nazareth uh, is the prophet foretold by Moses in Deuteronomy 18, the lineal descendant, son of David. That's the real issue all the time. Um, and then Jesus goes on to say, verse 54, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. And you have not come to know him, but I know him. And if I say that I do not know him, I will be a liar like you. In other words, a false prophet. But I do know him and keep his word. Stafford are irrefutable for his position. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw and was glad. So the Jews said to Jesus, you are not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. That's not what Jesus said, is it? Jesus says in verse 56, very black and white clear, that Abraham saw his day. Now, what would that be a reference to? There's an um, interesting comment, again, from most of these uh, sources I'm using are not Socinian so-called. They're not biblical Unitarian sources. You're, th these are your standard so-called evangelical, mostly Trinitarian scholars writing uh, many of these comments. Let me show you this interesting comment from the Net Bible, the New English Translation, on John 8, 58. Yes, on footnote 154 and verse 56, and it he saw it, so Abraham saw Jesus? No, he saw the day, the Messiah, the day of the Messiah, let's say. And then this footnote on on the word glad, 154, what is the meaning, if you can see down there, I hope, what is the meaning of Jesus' statement that the patriarch Abraham saw his day and rejoiced? The use of past tenses would seem to refer to something that occurred during the patriarch's lifetime. Now, the commentators here note a rabbinic source called Genesis Rabbah, or a commentary on the book of Genesis from Jews. Uh, I'm not sure how old this might be, but 
and it states that Rabbi Akiva, a, fa a famous rabbinic figure in Judaism, in a debate with another rabbi, held that Abraham had been shown not this world only, but the world to come. This would include the days of the Messiah. Okay, so that's very interesting. So what did uh, sorry, Abraham see? Well, he saw the coming of the kingdom, otherwise known as the world to come, or the age to come, as the, as the Tanakh, the Old Testament, calls it. So that's what Abraham saw, not who Abraham saw. So when Greg Stafford says that we are doctrinally driven, well, I would ask him, isn't this his doctrine that he shares with others? That's true. That Jesus literally saw Abraham because Jesus was there as a spirit son who destroyed himself, as he said, or killed himself, really, to become or to reappear, I guess, as... The so that is uh, that interesting section there. Now let's go to another clip here. And this has to do with the, the wisdom of God in Proverbs 8. Many of you are familiar with this passage where wisdom, Sophia in Greek, is presented as a woman, as a she. And it says that she is, wisdom is with God. And in the beginning, it, wisdom came about and, and so on. So let's, let's see what he says about this. I think based on what the Bible says, presentation of Jesus, Proverbs 8 too, right? We talked about references of where Jesus talks about pre-existence. Well, what does he say in, in Luke and Matthew? I, the wisdom of God, am sending you forth among these people in this and that. They're gonna, some of you, they're going to do this and that. Right? In one account, it says the wisdom of God says this. In the other account, he says it. And the deity passed her on. The, the combined gospel account, basically, of the second or third century. It says, it combines those accounts saying, and has Jesus saying, I, the wisdom of God, just like Proverbs 8, right? I, wisdom. Not only that, though, you not only have that, in my opinion, direct synoptic gospel identification of Jesus as the wisdom of God, which in the context of their knowledge of Proverbs and the Book of Wisdom and other wisdom literature, that presented this, I believe, actual personal entity of wisdom not god's wisdom right because then god wouldn't have had wisdom according to the greek translation at one point and even the other church didn't fully embrace a non-personal view of that text but i would say the synoptics also refer to micah 5 when they give the birth of uh, the nativity accounts they refer to micah 5 and the parts of the prophecy that talk about jesus being born in bethlehem which is right in the context in the very verses where he is said to have been from of old or ancient times, or in the Greek, his his activities, right? His goings forth, his high exodoi. And the only other time that term occurs in the Greek Septuagint is in Proverbs 8, 35, where wisdom's activities or goings forth are described prior to all things being made. So I believe that text speaks to pre-existence, connects with Wisdom in Proverbs 8, which speaks to pre-existence, which connects to the synoptic gospel's identification of Jesus' as wisdom. I don't see how you can't have pre-existence by quoting Micah 5 and by identifying Jesus' as wisdom, which couldn't, I think, be done without understanding Proverbs 8. Those texts, right, Proverbs 8 says that wisdom was created, katizo in the Greek, <clears throat> kana in the Hebrew, kana frequently means create, right, just like when Eve says, I created a child with the help of Jao, ja oh, in my view, right? Talking about Cain. Yes, it can mean possessed or by, but again, context. These terms can mean a lot of things, uh, like apostasy, so we get to Hebrews 1, 3. But what, what is ta being talked about there and then there? So in Genesis, where Eve talks about Cain, clearly it's we're talking about birth, right? The, the birthing of Cain, the creation of a child. Well, in Proverbs 8, that's exactly what we're talking about. The beginning of God's way created as or begotten as the beginning of his way. Both verbs are used, ganao and katizo. And then other Hebrew and Greek verbs are used to describe this knitting together or being made prior to all things and existing as a child in God's presence. 
right? Kind of like in my view, the things Jesus talks about in John 17, the glory I had be with you before the world was. That's clearly what is talked about in Proverbs 8, if, if you understand that as a personal account of activity between an, an existing being, wisdom, and Jaho, who created wisdom. So I do think that he's number one. He's the very first thing God created or begot. I don't see him as a difference in terms of coming into existence. I do understand a difference procedurally, right? Cain was born, Adam was created. But in terms of a start to life, right? So I see Jesus as the beginning, right? He's literally called that in Proverbs, created as the beginning, RK, Reishi. Same thing in Proverbs of Revelation 3, the RK. And I believe that should be beginning. But even if you take, he's still the RK. So this term used in Micah 5 also, after he was made or her, it's not, not meant to be a gender thing it's in metaphysics. Okay, so let's review some of that. Uh, Greg, Greg Stafford says, Jesus says, I, the wisdom of God. I'm not sure I didn't pick up the source for that quote, but obviously uh, in the New Testament, as far as I know, Jesus never says that. Uh, now, we obviously understand that Jesus is what wisdom became. In other words, uh, Paul, I think the, the letter to the Corinthians says that Jesus has become the wisdom of God for us. Yes, uh, Jesus now is identified with all those qualities of God and wisdom, word, even the spirit, right? He's the spirit of Christ is synonymous many times with the spirit of God, because he takes upon his person, let's say, all those things that the God has uh, lovingly bestowed on him as his obedient son. So, so now he's the word of, uh, how do we say it? We, he, Jesus is now the word of God on, on two feet, you know, <laughs> uh, he's the wisdom of God. He's, he's everything. Now, all those qualities can now be seen in and through the Son of God. Uh, and then Greg talked about the birthing of wisdom, like Cain in Genesis. And wisdom now existing as a child in God's presence. The If you notice there in, in the clip, if you go back and listen to what he said, he carefully said that this is not to, to Greg Stafford. Proverbs 8 is not about the wisdom of God as such. Um, so he said that because obviously when you say that wisdom was birthed and wisdom is a literal child who is the spirit son Jesus, uh, then you're saying that the wisdom of God had a beginning. But obviously God is eternal. It's God's wisdom. God's word, these are all eternal qualities that belong to, pertain to God himself, who's eternal, God the Father. So he carefully distinguished there be, between the this figure of, of Sophia, a woman, wisdom portrayed as a woman, and uh, as having a beginning, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old, from everlasting I was established. So obviously this is a this is typical Hebraic way of speaking about a quality of God as if it's a person or personification of one of the qualities of God. So it's interesting that <clears throat> Greg has to to suit his his understanding. He has to say that Proverbs 8 is not about the wisdom of God as such, because how can we say at some point then God did not have a wisdom if he's reading this so literally? And so that's, that's a big uh, problem there. After he was made or her, said Greg, it's not meant to be a gender thing. It's metaphysics. Again, he has a, a big problem here because wisdom, once again, is described as a woman very clearly throughout this text. Uh, if you keep reading Proverbs chapter 9, Proverbs 10, wisdom is a her, is a she, a woman. So 
obviously grammatical gender uh, should not be confused with an actual biological person as well, especially when you're dealing with personification. Speaking of a thing, or in this case, a quality of God, wisdom, as if it is a person. Now, some time ago, we had a brief uh, comment exchange, uh, Greg and I, uh, bec due to one of his videos, I posted a comment about it regarding this topic on wisdom. And let me just play you there. My reply to the way he sort of twisted what we mean by personification and how this Proverbs 8 should be understood. So let me play you here my answer, which all these videos, most of these videos you can find on, on, on this YouTube channel or the mother YouTube channel, Restoration Fellowship. So let me play you this. Hi everyone, Carlos here. Just a quick video responding to this video from Greg Stafford I was just notified about, where he addresses comments that some of us so-called Sassinians left on one of his videos. And this is the video, Sam Shamoon's complete collapse over the personification of wisdom. So I had left a comment myself that you can scroll down and see and read, but I noticed that Greg left out the last comment I left. I'm not sure if he did not see it, just ignored it, but here it is. This is the last comment I left. But basically he was accusing me of denying what we would call the second definition of the word personification, according to Merriam Webster's online dictionary. So I said that I was not denying the second definition, but the Bible is not using it in this way. For example, Proverbs eight and nine is not describing a person representing or embodying Sophia, that is wisdom, the wisdom of God. The text here simply describes Sophia as a person which fits the primary Merriam-Webster dictionary definition that he kept relying on, the representation of a thing or abstraction as a person. Of course, a person can represent or embody a quality concept or thing, as the secondary definition shows. And one of the examples Merriam-Webster uses, he was the very personification of British pluck and diplomacy. Now I said that a British pluck and diplomacy is not a person as such. It's like saying that you, Greg Stafford, are a personification of evil itself. But Stafford seems to continue to insist that the Proverbs writer is using the secondary definition, they're the second bullet point of the word personification. So I think we could rightly say Jesus was the very personification of the word and wisdom of God when he was here alive on earth not before he was begotten, that is procreated in the womb of his mother, according to the virgin birth account of Matthew and Luke. That's not what the Proverbs writer is saying in Proverbs 8. It's not describing an already existing person representing this quality known as wisdom. Now, the fact that those qualities we find mentioned and described as persons like wisdom in the Old Testament are now to be found in the human person of Jesus is a conclusion that even many notable Trinitarian scholars who obviously hold to a similar literal pre-existence view as many non-Trinitarians like Stafford have come to. For example, the noted German scholar Carl Joseph Kuschel, Jesus was God's wisdom in person, but not a personified, hypostatized, that is an actual pre-existent figure alongside God, which is what Greg insists is happening in Proverbs 8, that Jesus was already existing as an actual self, a person who Stafford and others call a God, and that this little g God was representing this quality known as wisdom. That's, again, that's just not what Proverbs 8 says. Another Trinitarian scholar here, who holds obviously to a literal pre-existence similar to Stafford. What a wisdom word Christology claims is that Jesus is the person, individual whom God's word became. Even to speak of the incarnation of the Son of God can be misleading. Unless the Son Christology of John is seen as it was probably intended as an expression of the same wisdom word Christology. So once again, we can rightly say, 
that Jesus is what the word, what the wisdom, even throw in there the glory of God became, not the other way around. The Old Testament does not believe that there was already a pre-existent Jesus, pre-existent son or a little G God running around representing the qualities of the one God that the Jews know as Yahweh or Jehovah and who the New Testament writers called the father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. So back live here, I, I hope that was clear. So that was the, uh, the claim or the twisting that Greg did that uh, he was taking one of the other definitions of a word. You see how this happens? Again, words have different meanings depending on the context. So he took <laughs> the other definition of the word personification, but he's already doctrinally devoted. So he thinks uh, a person, there's a person in Proverbs 8 to 10, who's a woman, again, this gender, the gender issue is important in this case, because if he believes it's literally a, a person, an individual, the spirit's son, then that just does not fit the text. I mean, okay, so, and then uh, before we move from here, again, on the human Jesus side, on the traditional Trinitarian texts, we have information on Micah 5.2, which he also appealed to. And again, look at this ESV study Bible, not a so-called Socinian or Unitarian publication. This text is referring to the Messiah's ancient Davidic lineage, confirming that the ancient covenantal promises made to David still stand. The Hebrew from ancient days refers to ancient historical times. And then this same Hebrew phrase is used in Micah 714 exactly as as in the same way basically so it has nothing to do with some uh, eternal existence before you come into existence so check that out now this whole thing um th this whole discussion or interview uh, had an interesting segment here, another clip I'll play from the, again, the full discussion you can find in the link I provided in the video of this, or the description of this video. And uh, our friend there, Faithful Theology, asked about Hebrews 1. Uh, so how do, how do you explain the fact that Hebrews 1 says that God in, in the past spoke to the prophets, or in the prophets in these last days, in his son. So here's Greg's take on that. God who spoke long ago in many ways by means of the prophets. It, it literally says, I think, in the prophets has during these last days spoken to us in his or a son. I believe that in the Old Testament, God maybe a couple times spoke directly, but otherwise was always speaking through his sons, the angels. So for example, in Acts 7, you have the angels on the top of Mount Sinai giving the law, and you have them speaking in the burning bush to Moses. But in the actual accounts, it's God, it's Yahweh. But that is not how that the Hebrews 1 author is writing this, I believe. I believe he's speaking of it in terms of how those sons of God, or God spoke through those sons in the burning bush to Moses and others, who then spoke to everyone. The message was conveyed from God through his sons to these prophets and in and in them god acted <clears throat> right god appeared through moses essentially in some way to perform the miracles before pharaoh he gave him the power god was speaking to people through prophets in old times in these last days like john 14 says god is actually in the sun doing everything right it's not like the sun doesn't break excuse me just like Gabriel or, or angels break to, to talk to people outside of their mission or role at times. They're, we're individuals, they're individuals. But everything they're actually there to do and represent, it's, it's the Father. So in the old times, prophets, imperfect men, powerful figures, faithful men, but nothing like a perfect son. Nothing even like Adam, really. Well, I guess like him, but without sin is a big difference. I believe he's talking about how he spoke 
to people through prophets after the message was delivered by him through his sons. And then in the same way, he spoke to the son directly as one of those sons who became a man. It's a little bit different. Those prophets didn't do any of that stuff. They were humans who were chosen by God after they were born. The son was actually sent by God. He says this over and over, right? I came from above. I, I'm from here. I'm not from here. I'm from above. All these old prophets, these Old Testament humans are from here. They're, they're human prophets. This is a son. This is someone I believe the, the author of Hebrews is saying is different. And so whereas God spoke to us through these prophets of old, I don't believe he's excluding the fact that the accounts also explicitly teach God used angels to speak to the prophets. So it's not it's not excluding that whole uh, representation. It's talking about the end result, right? Who did the pro who did the people actually end up talking to? Moses, Isaiah. Who did the people actually end up talking to? Jesus. So I believe that's what he's saying that God spoke to us directly at the end point through prophets in the old times, and now he's talking through us in a, using a son, whom I would say is one of those sons, but Socinians would say is only his son in the sense of the revelation that he is manifested as. And again, that's more interpretive. The idea of sons being sons of God, personal sons of God, all throughout the, the Old Testament and the New. So I'm not like just coming up with something that's apart from that. Okay, so let's look at the passage in question first. Uh, I'm using the NAB revised because I want to show you one of the headings from this translation. So in times past, God spoke in partial various ways to our ancestors through the prophets or in the prophets. That's fine. In these last days, he, that is God, spoke to us through or in a son. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the things Greg said. In the Old Testament, God is always speaking through his sons. God spoke to people through prophets after the message was delivered by him through his sons. And then in the same way, he spoke to the son directly as one of those sons who became a man. The son was sent by God, he says, that, he says that over and over. I came from above. Yes, uh, the statement in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, I agree with Greg, does not exclude the fact that God spoke through the angels as well. So I think the point here is that primarily he speaks in the prophets, and then in these last days, uh, primarily in a son. But isn't the son always primary? I mean, he should be. He's the unique, the, the only begotten son of God. So why God did not primarily speak in a son? Why choose lesser beings than, than the son? I, I would like to ask that of Greg. And the whole point of this chapter, this is why I'm using the NAB, is to show how the son is higher or superior than the angels. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Or again, I will be a father to him, he shall be a son to me. So if Jesus preexisted as one of the sons of God, that's what Greg said, he pointed to Genesis 6, Job 1. So he was an angel. So, and then he said, but he was the son of God. Okay, so he's a very special angel the angel. Now, my question would be, how do you explain Hebrews 1 verse 5? I'm sure Greg has uh, an explanation somewhere, but in this discussion, again, it needed a follow-up. But the fact is that the whole chapter of Hebrews 1 is exactly to prove what Greg is trying to disprove. <laughs> that Jesus was actually not an angel. So he's trying to dispel the notion that Jesus was not an angel, Greg. But this chapter clearly is showing you that he was not an angel. Again, to which angel, that's Psalm 2-7, 
did God ever say, you are my procreated son? To no angel. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, Greg still believes uh, the Archangel Michael interpretation of his former JW days. But an archangel obviously is still an angel. <clears throat> and then he says that the son became a man. Nowhere do you, do you see that. Nowhere do you find that. There's no verse. There's no passage saying that uh, the man Jesus, the one we know as Jesus of Nazareth, what is the result of a becoming by another from another state and again i don't understand uh because greg started by saying as i showed you uh detailing his spirit spirit son christology and he said that this being spirit son being killed himself destroyed himself so when he goes on to talk about uh, becoming man and things like that, well, there's there's nothing there to become because there's no being. So again, these are a lot of questions that are happening here. And then he says the son was sent by God. Well, that's typical prophetic way of speaking. John the Baptist was sent. You read that in the beginning of, for example, the Gospel of Mark in john as well uh, the prophets are sent so that does not mean they're literally sent from a location uh, where they previously existed or previously lived it simply means a commissioning sent and yes jesus does say i came from above he even says i came down from heaven in john chapter 6 but obviously the language in john chapter 6 is not to be taken literal or else you'll end up like the Pharisees thinking Jesus is teaching some, some kind of cannibalistic ritual. <laughs> because he says, I'm the flesh or the bread that came down out of heaven. I came down out of heaven as flesh, as literal bread? Obviously not. So uh, now we move to, is this the last? Yes, one of the last sections. So again, this is from... A review from this uh, interview discussion that was had a couple of days ago at over at Faithful Theology's channel. And now he's asked, uh, Greg, why the Gospel of John is so different than the other Gospels? And I want to point some things out, he said here. I believe he is different, and there's a good reason. Now, as I did say, though, I do believe the, the synoptics provide evidence connections with Micah 5, Proverbs 8, that, that would entail, I believe, proof of pre-existence. But, but I do believe John is is different because we'll look at him, right? He's, he's Jesus' beloved disciple, number one. He got the revelation of divine information that Jesus received from God. He's the only one who calls him the word. Halagos, right? None of the other synoptic writers do that. So when Socinians want to say, well, you know, only John explicitly has Jesus claiming pre-existence. Again, I deny that based on him claiming to be wisdom in, in the synoptics, but it's a little different, John. That's true. It's more explicit, more repeated. But John's the only one that actually calls him the word. So Socinians make a big deal about that, that he's the word of God, right? He's the impersonal word, spoken word of God. Well, only John says that. So does that somehow make that not not true? No, of course not. John's the only one that says God is love. Does that, does that mean it's not true? No. Do so saints believe John is inspired and, and have equal authority with the synoptics? Yes. So what is the question really designed to do? I guess minimize the source material for pre-existent evidence in the New Testament, but I, I think it ignores some I, I've mentioned. Um, but, you know, John did get the most information, I believe, right? He got this revelation that we have that presents Jesus in ways far beyond what else we read in the New Testament. So he's got this fuller understanding, for sure, of who Jesus is, the authority he has, right? He's on God's throne. He's receiving divine revelations, right? So he's, he's not God in the ultimate sense. He's functioning as a messenger, as I believe an archangel. So I believe the answer to your question is that John was not only Jesus' closest disciple, he not only loved him the most, most close to him, 
but he got the revelation that had more information than anybody else. And I believe he got the revelation before he wrote his gospel. Otherwise, how would he have known that he was, the, his name was the word of God, Revelation 19, 13, which I believe again proves that the word is not a description of an impersonal an abstraction, right? A word, like you speak a word, but it's a, it's a name. It's literally called a na the name he has it's presented as a person revelation with that name. But then John uses that name in John 1, 1 for his, for his existence in the beginning with God. So if the word is a name he got by revelation of an actually existing figure, right? He's on the horse, he's got the crown. Why would he then use that term, that name for an actually existing person he got in revelation for anything else? When he's talking about this, this being who was with God, that corresponds to what Jesus says about him being wisdom, with wisdom pre-existing. Now he's got the, the word, uh, the word, the new name word of God, word, so to me, that explains why in John, you don't get him using wisdom, which you do get in Matthew and Luke. So that's why I believe John is different. Most scholars, more, most commentaries, dictionaries of biblical studies will tell you wisdom and word are synonymous things in, in the Jewish understanding, in the Hebraic understanding. So when prophets talk about the wisdom of God, they invariably mean they or can mean the, the word of God, because the words of God are wisdom, of course. And it reminds us of Jesus himself when he says, uh, the words I, are, I speak are spirit as well. So word, wisdom, spirit, all synonymous things. So he's, he's again, Greg, making this uh, uh, distinction without a difference. So, but one, one thing I want to focus on and, and in this clip is something I, I have never come upon. So Greg says that John, the apostle, got the revelation. By that, he means the book of Revelation, the apocalypse. The, he got the most information, fuller understanding for sure, about who Jesus is, because Jesus loved him the most, the beloved disciple. Okay, that's fine uh, in a way, but uh, it goes to this, uh, what's known as the higher Christology narrative that the gospel of John is superior than the other gospels. So they're not equal. <laughs> so Matthew, Mark, and Luke sort of have what's known as a low Christology. So the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the gospel of John has what scholars have called the high Christology. <clears throat> That's why you will notice uh, many scholars that come from a Trinitarian system or a pre-existence system are, um, they rush to date the writings of John as the last of the writings. So chronologically, they say, well, the gospel of John is the last of the gospels. The, the revelation of John is the last thing that was put down in writing. They do that because of this narrative that somehow John has this higher Christology, but that is nigh impossible to ascertain as historians, which gospel came first, which one was put down first, spread around the, the known empire or world at that time first. It's, it's impossible to know. Now I do hold personally the view that all four gospels, if you read them, by their internal evidence, they showed that they were they had to be written, in my view, before the temple destruction of 70 AD. And a simple way to, to argue my, my point, my view, is to ask people to read carefully the Gospels. And you will see that there's zero hint, zero evidence of the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. You would think that one of those writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, would maybe uh, in passing mention something like that. Because the what happened in 70 AD was such a shift, such, such a massive sort of atomic blast in Judaism, 
that I just find that impossible that none of the gospels even make a passing mention that, oh, by the way, the, in, the temple's gone or whatever, or where the temple used to be, nothing. So the internal evidence tells me all four were written before 70 AD. And again, it's, it's just impossible to tell where, which was which. But then Greg says, John got revelation before he wrote his gospel. Okay. And then he says that Revelation 19.13, where Jesus is called the word of God, if you remember coming on the white horse, proves the word, not an impersonal abstraction. John 1.1 1, 1 uses the name of an already existing person. You see what he did there? So, <laughs> so he's saying that John first put down in writing Revelation, and then he wrote the gospel. So if you were living at that time, and let's say these are publications, the Revelation of John is published first. So then you read it. And then John publishes the gospel, his gospel. So that when you come to the famous prologue in question, you already are primed, as it, as it were, by the author. Are primed to, to read the word as unfortunately most translations have it capitalized and as most translations uh, follow that with the he and the hymns, the personal pronouns. So <laughs> that's, that's something I've never heard or, or seen. So that that's like retroactively putting Jesus into the gospel of John because for Greg Stafford, Revelation comes first, and then the book of Revelation, the apocalypse, and then the gospel. So <laughs> that's quite a tricky thing, right, to me, it looks like. Again, there's no way Greg Stafford can prove this. No way any historian can prove this. When Which letter was published first or second or third, it's, it's just very difficult to, to do. So... All right, um, let's see. And, and I just want to, again, uh, emphasize what he initially said, Greg Stafford, in the first video. If you go back, uh, please rewind or just go back to that section. He believes the, the man we know, the person we know as Jesus of Nazareth, existed as a spirit son, and that person, Spirit son killed himself, destroyed himself. So, in other words, according to Greg Stafford, Jesus destroyed himself. Let me put this bigger. <laughs> so, according to his reading of Philippians 2, verses 7 8, Jesus destroyed himself. So, this pre existent spirit son killed himself and then found out or realized he was in the form of a man. That's what Paul is saying to Greg Stafford in Philippians 2, verses 7 and 8. So please just, uh, yeah, have a think about that. That's quite amazing. Um, before I go, let me try and get to, I'm sorry if uh, I miss your question here. But let me see, we have some comments. Uh, tr uh, Lady True, I'm grateful you had this review because I did uh, have a few questions that I think you're getting to. Thanks there. And you had one comment here. Uh, does John 17, 5 explain Luke 24, 26? Since Jesus disclosed to his disciples, he had to suffer to enter his glory. Kind of redundant if he was already there or if you was already God. Yeah, it's an interesting point, the connection there. If you'd like to see, uh, I think that, yeah, that, that works because if you read John 17 in context, once again, context is king, you will see that the glory that Jesus asks for, he goes on to say actually in John 17, actually, let me show you that. It's hotly debated. So he's asking for a glory he had with the Father in verse 5. But then if you keep reading, 
I pray not only for them, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me, I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory you gave me. Well, wait a minute. Didn't he just pray to get that glory back in verse 5? And then he goes on to say, I in them, you in me, that they may be brought to for perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me, that you loved them as you loved me, Father. They are your gift to me. I wish that they are that where I am, they also may be. Why? So that they may see my glory that you gave me. So the point here is that twice after Jesus says what he says in verse 5, he says he's already been given the glory. Well, obviously not. He hadn't been glorified yet. If by glory we're understanding uh, perhaps resurrection, Jesus is talking about here. Uh, his exaltation, uh, coming out of the grave uh, as the new glorified man. So obviously this language uh, you have to handle with care. It, you know, it's not straightforward, uh, as straightforward, I should say, as, as we think. Uh, let's see, one more comment here. Why don't you set up a debate with Arians? Actually, yes, I have debated uh, people we might call Arians. I debated a Binitarian. Not sure if that classifies as an Arian. <clears throat> but you can find all my debates on the YouTube channel. Just use the search, the search tab, the search function in the YouTube channel, RF or this one. Uh, Joseph Miller debate Stafford Carlos on pre-existence. Again, I, I said it earlier, perhaps you weren't listening. Um, I have uh, reached out to Greg for many years and I just stopped because he just ignores you. Uh, he, he only answered that, that answer I, I showed with the video on, on wisdom. We just exchanged comments, uh, brief comments, and then he just ignored ignore my request so i have tried so so uh, lady true says uh hold on uh, common sense christianity john 17 22 future believers get the same glory they are not born yet it's glory in prospect yes that's a good way of putting it uh john is is uh you know, you have to be, again, careful with the Gospel of John. Jesus says things like, you have eternal life. And that is life of the age to come. In other words, he's telling you, you, have, you are in the kingdom. You have the kingdom. You have immortality. Well, is that true? Obviously not. So they say there's a present quality of Christian living, if you will, that is said to be with us now. But obviously... Um, you know, we don't have it yet. All right. So I'll leave it at that. I hope this helped. And I'll just leave you with this uh, video I did. And in, uh, in answer to a challenge uh, Greg put forth in this discussion, in this interview. And I hope I, I meet the challenge he uh, asked for here. So thanks for watching and hope uh, this helps. I don't know where does the Bible say Jesus pre-existed? Just anywhere. It's very clear where. John 115 and 130. John says, one coming after me, right? Because they're all looking at John and he's doing all this stuff. And John was born before Jesus as a man. So John says, there's one coming after me who's better than me because he was before me. How could that be? If John was born before Jesus as a man, and John is saying, this person who was born after me actually existed before me. So he's, he's superior to me. I have never had a Sasanian explain that to me. And I've presented it several times and there's just no answer. It kind of gets weird, but I'm open to anybody who can tell me exactly how 
John could believe Jesus existed before him when he was actually born before Jesus. So you have John 1.15. One paraphrase reads, the one who is coming after me is greater than I am because he was living before I was even born. And some translations read, the one who is coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. And again, after me comes a man who ranks above me because he existed before me. So these are sayings by John the Baptist. He's believed to have been at least six months older than him. So did John the Baptist really believe his younger cousin was older than him. So if we look at the first part of the phrase by the Baptist, he's talking about authority, someone coming that will outrank him. The Greek there is simply meaning rank or status as some translations that we saw read. In the other parallel passages in Mark and Matthew, this is because the one coming or behind the Baptist, as it were, some believe Jesus was part of the early disciples of the Baptist, is more powerful than he is. Contrast the Baptist, also who's said to have been sent from God and was ahead of Jesus in time, that is, he was born before Jesus was born, though clearly not in status or rank in John 3.28. So some translations read, you yourself, says the Baptist, can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. And some paraphrase this as the Baptist saying, I'm only the one God sent to prepare the way for him. So the Baptist knows his role as one who's preparing the way for the Lord, as, as he says in one of the Gospels. But never would he have thought he was preparing the way from some pre-existent Messiah that was older than him. The same Greek word can be found in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament in Genesis 48, when Abraham placed Ephraim before Manasseh. And that word before there is the same one used in John 1.15 and John 1.30. So this is about status and rank. It's not about chronological timelines. So in John 1.30 again, a man who was before me, he says. Now I'll show you here a couple of ways to understand this. Apart from a literal pre-existence, as if the Baptist is talking about a being that somehow existed before the Baptist was born. So one way of looking at this is through the lens of preeminence or chiefdom that is emphasized once again. This man, this human being who was before me, as he had previously said, is greater than him because he outranks him. So this would be a tautology. Another way of looking at it is through the chronological timeline, but as a prophetic promise that has been fulfilled. So what was foretold, foreknown about the Messiah that he would be the seed of the woman all the way back in Genesis 3, and the prophet Micah talking about his origins are from old, it could simply mean that this figure, this Messiah figure that the Baptist was preparing the way for, had been prophesied way before the Baptist was even born, not that he literally pre-existed as a person, let alone as God the Son, or an angel, or a little g God. Now this phrase, origins from old in Micah 5, we find a parallel in the same book in chapter 7. You will extend truth to Jacob, mercy to Abraham, that you swore to our ancestors from the days of old. So you see there the, a prophetic promise regarding the patriarchs of Israel. And that prophecy, that promise goes back to the days of old or the days of antiquity or some translations or paraphrases simply say, from ancient times you promised this. And again, note the word in John 1.30, man, a human being, meaning that John's focus is always the human Messiah. And you have the great climax to the whole gospel in John 20.31, where John says that you must believe that he is the Son of God, the Christ of God. And in order to be a Messiah figure, you have to be a human being, God the Son or an angel or whatever, cannot be said to be a legitimate anointed descendant of David, let alone a mediator for humanity. Let's look at a quote from J.T. Robinson here. He wrote that the gospel portrays Jesus in Jewish apocalyptic mysticism of primacy and ultimacy, before and after, above and below. For what's here is a greater than Solomon or Moses, than Jacob or Abraham, 
and so must be recognized as being before them and above them, and indeed before all and above all. But what is here is a man who has been given an authority as the authentic son of man, reaching back to the very beginning of God's purpose and extending to its end. And then you can compare that to his allusion to Daniel 7, the son of man figure. Even the most exalted Johannine affirmations of timeless pre-existence and heavenly ascendancy are made not to question his humanity, but to enhance it. In fact, says Robinson, when the Baptist reiterates the assertion of Jesus' priority in John 1.30, he adds the word a male or a man. To say that Jesus is before him, before the Baptist, is not to lift him out of the ranks of humanity, but to assert his unconditional precedence. To take such statements at the level of flesh, to imply, as the Jews interpret him, that at less than 50 years old, Jesus is claiming to have lived on this earth before Abraham, is to be as crass as Nicodemus, who understands rebirth as an old man entering his mother's womb a second time. These are not assertions about the ego or the person of the human Jesus, which is no more pre-existent than that of any other human being, nor are statements about the glory that he enjoyed with the Father before the world was, John 17, 5, to be taken at the level of psychological reminiscence. As such, they would clearly be destructive of any genuine humanness.